An undercover video reveals new evidence that supports a horrifying allegation about human rights abuse in China and sheds light on who the principal victims are. Not all reporters inside China are facing crackdowns on how they can cover the coronavirus. Some are being praised by the authorities. But what kind of articles are they really publishing? The outbreak has greatly impacted global business with China. A Wall Street financier says a lack of transparency will push American investors away from the country. And the UK and Ireland are now included under President Trump's European travel ban. UK coronavirus deaths doubled in only 24 hours yesterday, now rising to 21. Welcome to China In Focus. I'm your host, Tiffany Meyer. An undercover video provides new evidence for a 14-year-old yet still horrifying allegation that prisoners of conscience are killed for their organs in China, supplying the country's for-profit transplant market. As for the principal victims, they're mostly practitioners of the spiritual meditation discipline Falun Gong. Uh, in this undercover video, a liver transplant doctor in China is boasting that he and his team can find the highest quality livers for transplant. This is the latest piece of evidence of forced organ harvesting in China. The video was released for the first time at a recent policy forum on Capitol Hill. It was filmed by Yu Ming, a Chinese Falun Gong practitioner who later escaped to the U.S. Falun Gong, also known as Falun Dafa, is a spiritual meditation system for the mind and body. After its introduction in 1992, it spread throughout China thanks to reports of improved health and moral character. But fearful of its widespread popularity, the Chinese communist regime began to violently persecute the practice in 1999. In the five-minute video, he is shown visiting a number of hospitals in Beijing, posing as a patient in need of a transplant. He secretly recorded his conversations with doctors and medical staffs. <laughs> China's incredibly short wait times have been among the key reasons investigators believe forced organ harvesting is a reality in China. That's because patients can't just book a transplant, instead they have to wait for voluntary donors. More than 1,000 people die every year in the U.S. while waiting for an organ each year. In general, wait times can stretch for months or even years. At the forum where the video was published, the Victims of Communism Memorial Foundation released a new organ harvesting report. It states that before 2006, when Falun Gong practitioners made the first claims about forced organ removal, Chinese hospitals publicly advertised transplant wait times of one or two weeks. The doctor in the video says he has performed five or six hundred operations. He also told the person undercover that they can get an organ from someone who practices qigong or meditation, adding that they could even pick out the best one. The doctor said the quality of the organs is guaranteed by the armed police hospital in Beijing. He added that an organ has just arrived at the hospital that same day. The practice seems to be well known among patients. The video shows one liver transplant patient offering advice, saying that livers that come from people who meditate are best and that patients can tell their doctor what they want. One U.S. official says they've known for decades about the practice. She pointed out that Falun Gong practitioners are particularly vulnerable targets thanks to their good health. Indeed, 
There have been reports that patients requested Falun Gong practitioners, as you heard from Congressman Chris Smith explaining this, because the group's meditation practices supposedly made their organs healthier. As a Falun Gong practitioner himself, Yu said he was imprisoned for a total of 12 years in China. During that time, he was blood tested on at least three occasions. During his first imprisonment, he went on a hunger strike. Yu's written account was read aloud at the forum, which he attended. Matthew Robertson, author of the Human Rights Report, translated Yu's experience. While doing it, they said, don't you want to starve yourself to death? If your blood matches, we'll figure out a way to help you achieve that wish of yours. The spare parts in your body can even go to a good person as a contribution. Yu explained that a few days later, he overheard the doctor saying either his blood test was bad or the match was bad, so his life was spared. According to Robertson's report, beginning in 2000, China's organ transplantation sector exploded. Thousands of transplant surgeons were trained and hundreds of hospitals began offering routine transplants. The timeline coincides with the communist regime's persecution of Falun Gong, which started in July 1999. At the forum, New Jersey Congressman Chris Smith said it's easy to believe the acts are those of a few rogue doctors. And that is not the case. This is mainstreamed by this Chinese government dictatorship. The fact is that there is a massive infrastructure, development of facilities, and medical personnel for organ transplant operations often started before any voluntary donor system was even planned. An independent tribunal in London confirmed the existence of these practices. According to China Tribunal's final judgment earlier this month, there's been a population of donors that Chinese hospitals have access to and whose organs could be extracted on demand. The report said it was indeed Falun Gong practitioners who were used as a source, probably the principal source for the regime's long-term forced organ harvesting. We, the tribunal members, are all certain, unanimously and sure beyond reasonable doubt, that in China, forced organ harvesting from prisoners of conscience has been practiced for a substantial period of time involving a very substantial number of victims. Panelists at the forum said the world can't continue turning a blind eye to it. Newspapers have squelched stories or refused to correct misleading reports. Big human rights NGOs have said in effect, uh, we don't know anything about this. My final words it's inevitable that justice will prevail. However, it's our choice whether that happens sooner rather than later. Since the coronavirus outbreak started, authorities in China have tightened the control of information. In-depth reports from major outlets completely removed from the Internet. Citizen journalists disappearing and opinion blogs shutting down. But in contrast to all this, some reporters inside the country are being rewarded and their coverage is being promoted by state officials. We should use the pens and cameras in our hands as weapons to tell the world, loud and clear, how China has fought against the outbreak. Liao Jun, a senior reporter with state media Xinhua News, was invited as a guest speaker to a press event to share her experience. State media outlet China Daily called her a frontline superwoman fighting the virus. Another praised her for showcasing the responsibility of a media person. And yet people quickly found out that many of her reports are not truthful, but told the official party line instead. This is the same journalist who reported that eight people, including whistleblower Dr. Li Wenliang, have been, quote, legally punished for spreading rumors about the virus. Throughout January, she wrote several articles citing experts saying Wuhan's coronavirus outbreak is preventable and controllable. Liao repeated the authorities' deceptive talking points until last minute. In an article published on January 19th, she cited an expert saying there have been no infections among people who have been in close contact with the coronavirus patients, suggesting that the virus is not contagious among humans. The next day, on January 20th, Chinese authorities admitted that human-to-human -human transmission is happening. According to a state media report, Liao has published over 500 articles during the outbreak. I'm a reporter who has worked for over 20 years. I'm also a Communist Party member. The limelight on Liao has provoked debates in China. The virus whistleblower who spread truthful information were punished, and yet she who helped spread official fake news has been praised. One article circulating on WeChat said because of these untruthful reports, countless Wuhan residents were misled, countless were infected. 
The article asked Liao, "Do you feel sorry when you see the climbing number of infections and the death toll?" During the outbreak, China has seen a rare emergence of some in-depth reports countering official stories and voices for freedom of speech. And yet, the authorities also ramped up efforts to take down articles and posts that challenge the official narrative. Penny Zhou, NTD News. Chinese leader Xi Jinping visited Wuhan on March 10th. The next day, a video was posted online of a woman being interviewed by Chinese media. Nothing out of the ordinary, except she's reading from a script. The woman speaks a Hubei accent, where China's coronavirus outbreak first started. Xi Jinping's visit to Wuhan after emphasizing the importance of the new COVID-19 vaccine as a government official work, has been seen in the media. 我们也积极对居民进行心理疏导。呃，习总书记的讲话更加增强了我们基层工作人员的动力，使居民对打赢这场疫情阻击战更加有信心。休息，休息，休息。Netizens left comments mocking the interview. One Twitter user said, "This is a Chinese-style interview. Follow the Communist Party script and avoid any accidents." And on to the outbreak and its effect on business. Could this pandemic change the way investors do business with China? NTD's Miguel Moreno has more from a financial expert who says a lack of transparency will push investors away. China has suppressed information about the coronavirus since the beginning. Yet several countries have relied on its information for guidance. Economic and financial adviser Ziad Abdonor said the lack of transparency would change the way investors do business with China. If they don't show the world that they are under control, if they're not more、uh, transparent to the public, to the world, keep hiding their little cohort, their little thing, people lose trust. Smart money loses trust. Smart money wants transparency, wants openness. He added that the outbreak has exposed how heavily the U.S. relies on China. For example, the U.S. ran into a shortage of face masks because China stopped producing them. And according to Rosemary Gibson from the Hastings Center Research Institute, 90 percent of chemical ingredients for medicine that treats hospitalized patients with coronavirus are sourced in China. But Abdonor said the outbreak is helping people wake up. The Chinese, the Chinese economy is going to suffer the most,、uh, and they're going to wake up. Yeah, the U.S.-China relationship are changing already, and they're going to change even further. Gibson also said that heavy dependence on another country for medicine is a national security risk because it can be weaponized. Miguel Moreno, NTD News, New York. And Spain has copied Italy and has locked down the entire country, affecting 46 million people. This means people can now only go out for emergencies, to buy food, or for work. The number of cases and deaths in the country is rising fast. And Italy saw a massive 25% increase in cases on Friday. The number of deaths also jumped by 250 to over 1,200. By Saturday, the country had over 21,000 confirmed cases and nearly 1,500 deaths. It's now ramping up measures across the country. Starting Monday, people are only allowed out to buy food and medicine, commute to work, go to the hospitals and banks, or to care for the elderly or young. And President Trump's travel ban on parts of Europe has been extended to include the UK and Ireland. Vice President Mike Vice Pence President confirmed Jesse, Saturday morning the restrictions will take effect Monday at midnight. The UK's death toll doubled on Saturday, rising from 11 to 21. And in New York, the hardest-hit state in the U.S., Governor Andrew Cuomo announced the first coronavirus death Saturday morning. Cuomo said it was an 82-year-old woman from Brooklyn who had an underlying respiratory disease before contracting the virus. Apple plans to temporarily close all of its retail stores to help control the spread of the coronavirus. The company announced the plan on Friday to close all stores outside of Greater China until March 27th. Team members in the company's offices worldwide will work remotely if their job allows, and those required to be on site are advised to maximize interpersonal space. Apple said it will roll out new health screenings and temperature checks on all of its offices, and hourly workers will continue to be paid as usual. The mayor of Boston yesterday announcing the city's marathon will be postponed due to the coronavirus. 
We've shown before that no matter what the challenge is to our marathon and to our city, we are Boston strong. And that's what we will be again this year. The city of Boston has rescheduled its world famous marathon race from April 20th to mid September. The Boston Marathon, which began in 1897, hosts over 30,000 runners and up to a million spectators each year. The delay could lead to a significant setback for the city's economy, with an estimated loss of over $200 million. Top Japanese government officials said yesterday they were determined to hold safe and secure Olympics on schedule. A day after President Trump said Tokyo should consider delaying them for a year because of the pandemic. Japan's Olympics minister was quick to hit back at U.S. President Donald Trump Friday, saying the Olympics are on schedule and, quote, safe and secure. The remarks were made hours after Trump suggested Tokyo should delay the Games for a year amid the coronavirus outbreak. Just can't see having no people there. In other words, not allowing people. You know, I, I like that better than I like having empty stadiums all over the place. I think if you cancel it, make it a year later, that's a better alternative than doing it with no crowd. Officials say Japanese leader Shinzo Abe later spoke with Trump on the phone for about 50 minutes Friday morning Japan time. Trump then tweeted a more upbeat message calling the just-completed Olympic venue magnificent and saying Abe had done an incredible job and good things will happen for Japan and their great prime minister. Friday's comments fit with Japan's efforts to quash speculation that the Games may not go ahead. This year's Olympics have cost the country at least $12 billion in preparations and attracted more than $3 billion in domestic sponsorships. Up to 50 million jobs in travel and tourism could be lost because of the coronavirus epidemic as airlines, cruise operators and others reel from plummeting demand and travel restrictions. That's according to a leading body. Blow upon blow for the global travel industry. Up to 50 million jobs in travel and tourism are at risk because of coronavirus, the World Travel and Tourism Council said Friday calling on governments to cut travel taxes, simplify visas and introduce incentives as soon as the virus is under control. Airlines and other travel operators are reeling from Donald Trump's travel curbs on much of Europe Thursday. Companies worldwide freezing new hires, halting executive bonuses and offering unpaid leave as demand drops away, including the big US airlines, which are scrambling to cut flights to Europe. American Airlines and United said they'd be halving European services in April, with cuts carrying on into the summer season. Coronavirus has rocked the cruise industry too. Princess Cruises, the operator of two ocean liners that were quarantined, saying Thursday all 18 of its ships would suspend voyages for two months. Cancellations have already soared following the outbreak. Shares of Carnival Corp, the parent company, tumbled 18% on the news having already halved in value since the start of the year. Finland's Viking Line has also paused movement of its river ships and ocean liners around the world. And it's not just about getting there. Tourist hotspots and events are starting to close, including Disney theme parks in California and Florida. Nepal closed its Himalayan peaks, including Mount Everest, to climbers because of fears of an outbreak. It'll be a serious blow for the mountain country just as spring expeditions get started. Home to eight of the world's highest peaks, Nepal will lose permit fees and income for agencies, Sherpa guides and many others. Here at China In Focus, we bring you first-hand information from inside China. Don't forget to subscribe for the latest updates.